Today's presentation should be viewed as a continuation of sorts of the presentation that I gave in July. That presentation was an introduction to the health neighborhood and was admittedly a tad more academic than fits everyone's tastes. Today we're going to dive a little further into the, the practical aspects of the topic by talking about one specific kind of partner, therapeutic specialty courts, specifically drug treatment or recovery courts. I explained the series objectives during the July presentation. If you are unable to attend that session or would like to review it, it is available from our YouTube channel. It is also viewable directly from the Community of Practice resource site, which I've linked to in a couple emails, and as of right now, I put into the chat box. If you would like to click that link and bookmark it. Uh, I did want this slide to be the PDF version of the presentation, but otherwise I'm not gonna be uh, go, not going through this bullet by bullet. However, I do want to give a map of what we're going to do today. In today's presentation, I want to provide a little bit of background on the drug courts themselves, because I think knowing this information can be helpful as you think about your shared goal areas and the kinds of projects that make the most, most sense for this, this particular intersectoral collaborative partnership. Uh, I want to highlight that the evolution that drug courts have experienced so far presage future evolution, an evolution that in fact we are in the midst of and in which public health can provide a guiding hand. And I want to identify some key institutional constraints we need to keep in mind as we design our drug court partnerships. Finally, uh, I want to take just a, a talk about a few key areas of potential uh, strategic alignment. So without further ado, let's go. So first, a quick note on terminology, the terminology that appears in that, the header of this slide. The literature, the academic literature, uh, recognizes the specific, that uh, recognizes that the, that the specific specialty court that helps participants recover from substance dependence has two generations. The first so-called generation are often referred to as drug courts, and the second generation as drug treatment courts. Now, this is not a, a standardized or required way of referring to, to such courts, although I will maintain uh, that standard here. Arizona, for example, refers to all such courts as drug courts, even though all of them follow or at least try to follow the recommendations set up for drug treatment courts. Coconino County, I learned yesterday, calls theirs recovery court, which is probably an even better term. The first drug court was established in New York City in 1974 as a response to rapidly rising arrests for minor drug crimes. Court officials there recognized, recognized that these personal and transactional crimes were just not as serious as the violent crimes that they wanted to spend their time on. Uh, as such, those who had committed these sorts of crimes, these sort of small drug crimes, transactional crimes, possession, uh, would just languish in jails. They would uh, clog the cells, they would clog the dockets, just waiting for their turn, or once they were given a turn, uh, they were using up resources that the court would, uh, uh, that the courts felt uh, would be better spent elsewhere. The drug court was seen as a way of developing processes that were faster, but also provided better justice in the sense that participants in drug court were less likely to be charged and incarcerated. The type of penalties they felt were better reserved for bigger crimes or for repeat offenders. The drug courts proved pretty popular. They spread across the country pretty rapidly, uh, especially throughout major urban areas, but ultimately they became the victims of their own success. The efficiency of the process encouraged more prosecutors to refer, to refer more people to drug court, and eventually it was the drug court dockets that exceeded capacity. And with their attention dominated by statistical efficiency, so-called improvements to that process led to what critics at the time called assembly line justice. And this is a pretty damning critique in the sense that one of the rationales of the drug court initially was that not all criminal offenses are equal and therefore the justice system should not be treating them as equal. So around the same time that traditional drug courts were becoming overstuffed and inefficient, a new model was developing in Miami-Dade County in Florida. The key difference between Miami-Dade and other jurisdictions is that while other jurisdictions measured their success by the speed at which they could process a case, Miami-Dade wanted to focus on getting their participants out of, an, out of endless cycles of arrest, 
incarceration, and rearrest. So while previous drug courts may have offered treatment, Miami-Dade made treatment and the human outcomes of treatment, like employment and housing, the central measurements of success. This was a practical application of what is called therapeutic jurisprudence. Therapeutic jurisprudence posits that involvement with the courts is just one of several social interactions that can have a positive or negative impact on a person's life, psychologically and or physically. As such, courts are potential change agents. Their procedures, rulings, and dispositions can help determine whether the individual that, that well, sorry, they can help determine whether the individuals that encounter that system will go on to encounter it again. Listed here is a non-exhaustive list of sort of major elements of the Miami-Dade County drug court structure that made it unique at the time. Later in this presentation, we'll look at the, what are called the 10 key components that have since been derived as evidence-based strategies for drug treatment courts and what Susan Williams from Mojave County mentioned in her talk at the last um, learning community call. When we get to those later slides, you will note several components that have since been demonstrated to effectively help drug treatment courts meet their objectives that were already present in 1989 in Miami. The timeline presented here may look familiar, at least in its rough outlines, as the courts that you may have worked with. Dade County's program averages between 12 and 18 months, although some participants may be involved longer. The participants go through various stages that begins with a, a withdrawal period uh, and ends with a maintenance phase. Obviously, uh, th these were the terms that uh, Miami-Dade used, other courts used different systems. At some point, the defense will recommend uh, discharge. Uh, the judge will review the case and the participant's progress. And if they agree with the defense, uh, the person will, quote unquote, graduate from the program, uh, often with an actual ceremony to celebrate their achievement. On the other hand, someone who is consistently non-compliant uh, to the judge's uh, restrictions is returned to the traditional criminal process. Knowing what the process is for your drug courts is important to, uh, as you try to design your programs and where you might uh, set up an intervention or an encounter. And while this is true for programs that hope to alter, say, the intake or the discharge processes, it's even more true if uh, you hope to design an intervention that works with a, a, a drug court participant throughout the 12 to 18 month uh, time that they're engaged with the courts. Perhaps the most important feature of drug treatment programs are courts. And the reason uh, there are now thousands of such courts all over the country and in the territories is that they work much better than the alternatives. Compared to participants who elected to not go through a drug treatment court, those who do have fewer rearrests, lower incarceration rates sort of generally, fewer prison sentences specifically, longer times before rearrest, and fewer drug tests compared to those uh, who are under electronic or standard probation, electronic surveillance or standard probation. Uh, this reduction in the amount of future involvement with the criminal justice system, and of course, the reduction in the actual crimes, criminal behavior, ultimately means these types of interventions realize significant savings uh, above and beyond the money that's invested to create and maintain them. The gains mentioned on that previous slide are derived from the operation of a simple underlying model pictured here, namely that addiction causes criminal behavior. If you reduce addiction, then you reduce criminal behavior. And I know this seems really obvious because it's true, uh, but the, the, the underlying rationale here is drug treatment courts attempt to reduce future criminal behavior by addressing addiction today. And we'll return to this simple model and revise it in just a little bit. This simple model just doesn't tell a whole story, a complete story. And there's growing support for the idea that a more nuanced approach may be more effective than the drug treatment courts have proven to be so far. So I've used this slide here simply because Dr. Morris and I have both used it in the two previous modules. The story here is that addiction and incarceration are both outcomes as are relapse and recidivism. The rel their, their outcomes of other underlying uh, needs and gaps. Um, but so uh, let's just map this out uh, a little bit more clearly. So here's our simple model again. In the last few years, um, maybe going back about a decade, 
there's been a push to expand this model to push it further upstream. As I just mentioned, addiction itself is an outcome. Not everyone tries drugs. Not everyone who tries drugs continues to use them, and not everyone who uses recreationally develops an addiction, let alone one that attracts the attention of the criminal justice system. And what that simple model didn't really address, of course, is that, that there are other causes of criminal behavior. Not everyone who commits a crime has used drugs, let alone in a dependent, problematic manner. So DTCs, drug treatment courts, do not have perfect results. Participants in DTCs have fewer rearrests than those who don't, but they don't have zero rearrests. They have longer periods before rearrest, but that time isn't infinite. And some of these participants who are eventually rearrested will have relapsed to, their, to the drug they received treatment for, but some won't have, but will go on to commit new uh, attack in a criminal, uh, criminal way, uh, regardless of the fact they didn't relapse. So what causes relapse and what causes addiction in the first place? What causes criminal behavior when drugs aren't involved? It turns out, as I mentioned on the previous slide, that many of the risk factors associated with addiction are also risk factors for criminal behavior. So here's, this is a slightly more complicated model. And here we see that factors like poverty, marginalization, and trauma are associated with addiction and with criminal behavior, even when drugs aren't present. It is also true, given the premises of therapeutic jurisprudence, that the experience of being involved with the criminal justice system can contribute to the risk factors that lead to relapse or directly to relapse itself. So one thing I, I, I want to take time to emphasize here is that nicotine is a drug. And as Dr. Morris is quick to point out, an addiction is an addiction is an addiction. So when you're looking at this visualization and you see that addiction square, the second square from the left, definitely be thinking of, quote, the addiction the person is in DTC to have treated, but also be thinking of their nicotine use. As Dr. Morris pointed out in last month's presentation, there is a bi-directional relationship between nicotine and other drugs. Early nicotine use primes the brain for future addictions. Some of the physical alterations to the brain caused by addiction can actually go away when drug use is stopped, but if a person stops, say, heroin, but continues to use nicotine, this corrective process is slowed and perhaps stopped entirely depending on which specific changes we're talking about. This is one reason that co-treating nicotine along with other drugs leads to improved outcomes from both. It is also true that when you see that risk factor box all the way to the left and see that arrow that points to addiction, you should be thinking that, the, you should be thinking that those risk factors led to, say, a heroin dependence but you should also be aware that those very same risk factors were likely related to their nicotine dependence as well. It is also true that smoking itself contributes to some of these risk factors. Being a smoker can make it harder to get certain jobs. It can make it hard to get or keep housing. It causes and aggravates chronic conditions that may, may make keeping a job harder, etc. Which is all to say that whether your goal is to work with the courts to get housing for participants, or if your goal is to augment addiction recovery, or if your goal is directly related to criminal justice outcomes like recidivism, addressing nicotine use plays a role. The premises of therapeutic jurisprudence recognize that the court system needs to be designed in such a way that at the very least, it doesn't cause harm. But it also recognizes that those who find themselves in drug court are people in trouble. As such, more than simply not adding to their trouble, the courts are uniquely situated to create some good. But just because academic, theoretical, quote unquote, therapeutic jurisprudence recognizes this reality, that doesn't mean that the actual practicing courts do. But it turns out that they do, and have for a while now. The document that the next two slides quotes was published by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals 17 years ago. And I'm not going to read these slides, but I did, I did want you to have them in your notes. Uh, I also want to point out while I'm on these two slides uh, that you, this is where you should recognize that some of those features of the Miami-Dade system from 1989 have since been proven to be effective uh, strategies for courts to adopt. And these are the 10 components of drug courts according to the NADCP. I've highlighted the ones uh, that were evident are, are in practice in Miami-Dade with that darker red color, so number two, for example. And speaking of number two, that actually encapsulates three of the components of the Miami-Dade model, uh, which is the non-adversarial approach, 
as well as the team-based and shared decision-making elements. So uh, while we have only identified, here's three more uh, that were um, evident in Miami-Dade. And so while I've only identified, say, five top-level similarities between the Miami-Dade County model uh, of their seven uh, compared to these 10, uh, I do want to note that all drug courts, uh, or all drug treatment court programs that I know of, uh, and in fact, the way they are normally talked about is that involvement in the program is, is voluntary. The only other component of dates that we didn't uh, find, uh, even a specific, uh, that was not completely listed as a, one of the 10 key components is a specific eligibility standard. Uh, all DTCs do have an eligibility standard, uh, although they vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna return to this uh, eligibility standard and that screening process in just a little bit. For now, I just wanna focus our attention out of these 10 on just these two, numbers four and 10. Numbers four and 10 individually and together represent acknowledgement that the best run courts will be run as hubs within what BHWP calls a health neighborhood, connecting participants to the social and medical needs they have outside of their um, substance abuse. Uh, things that raise the risk of relapse, raise the risk of non-compliance with the DTC program, raise the risk of incarceration, and further down the road, raise the risk of rearrest as well. The reason I want to highlight these components is to reiterate that while this seems really obvious to those of us in public health, it's also obvious to the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. But it's also worth pointing out that as late as 2008, so six years after these were listed as uh, best practices, the National Drug Court Institute had called realizing the benefits of numbers four and 10 difficult to do. And not much has changed in the years since that point has been made. The hope that BHWP has going forward is twofold. First, to raise awareness that the dictates of numbers four and 10 were called from practice-based evidence. That is, though difficult, it has been done and can be done again. The other is to propose that one reason it has proven difficult is that the first rationale of drug courts is to provide streamlined, efficient processes, and that the skills and knowledge required to provide that critical service means having advanced training and practice in court processes, paperwork, review and submission, case analysis, legal screening, etc. This, by its nature, means they cannot have advanced knowledge of population health management best practices and clinical guidelines. But what a court can do is maintain and foster a robust relationship with organizations that already possess such skills and knowledge, namely public health. So I had initially called this section barriers to intervention success because the topics covered on the next couple slides are typically referred to as barriers uh, both in the sort of nerdy academic literature, but also in various industry reports coming from drug court professionals, the uh, Drug Court Institute and those, those areas. But the fact is that not everything here is a barrier per se, but everything here is real and it needs to be taken into account as you design a court level intervention or as you're thinking about the realistic benchmarks for your program's measurables. And so we're gonna begin here with what I, I assume is a concept familiar to a lot of you, and that's the social, so, social ecological model. Uh, the social ecological model serves as an adequate visual representation of the way factors at multiple levels have an impact on each subsequent lower or inner level. The SEM is visualized different ways and often includes more or fewer levels than, than those that are pictured here. Uh, the version used here is the one that most corresponds to the criminal justice system and the drug courts specifically. One thing to note is that while it is always the case that public policy significantly alters which organizations are major actors in the system and how those organizations are allowed to interact and how they do interact with one another, uh, the communities they're embedded in and the individuals that make up those communities, this is even more true when we are specifically talking about the drug courts uh, because every major actor that, uh, that either controls the drug courts or interacts with the drug courts is also a government entity itself. So uh, while the, uh, sorry. So in this way, uh, the existence or absence of a policy has an immediate and direct impact at every level. In many instances, when the social ecological model is deployed, many of the effects of the public policy level 
are indirect, uh, sometimes even unintended. While the criminal justice system is by no means immune to the scourge of unintended consequences, the primary salience of public policy are the unhelpful constraints it often deliberately imposes. For example, not extending Medicaid benefits to incarcerated individuals. One limitation of the visualization is that it too heavily implies a downward unidirectionality of influence. We won't get into it in this presentation, but one of the goals of a person-centered health neighborhood is to alter individual characteristics and community values in such, in such a way that they can positively steer public policy to lock in hard-won gains rather than waiting for public policy to take the lead. While public policy exercises a heavy influence in the way that the courts are run, uh, for example, by setting the standards by which certain individuals do or do not qualify for the program, most of the barriers I'm about to list will be the ones that take place at levels below the public policy sphere. The first bullet on this slide is a good example of a constraint that is not necessarily a barrier per se. It is true that there are more people incarcerated in America's rural areas. However, drug treatment courts depend on density in order to be financially viable. As such, if your hope is to reach rural tobacco using communities, it may be the case that the drug courts you have access to may be bad partners for that specific goal. That has, has nothing to do with the goal itself. Similarly, it's true that sex workers and violent offenders are two hard to reach vulnerable communities that share socio-demographic or socioeconomic characteristics that tobacco companies have been able to target and leverage to their own personal gain. Again, extending tobacco cessation services to those individuals is an admirable goal but because they are likely prohibited from participating in drug courts, the drug courts aren't a good partner to reach that goal. The third bullet is a legitimate barrier to working with drug courts. Because law schools do not traditionally or regularly train on mental health related issues, your potential key contacts at the courts might not fully understand the burden of tobacco use on the population that you're both trying to help. And if you were to convince them to partner, say through an educational intervention, they may still view certain key elements of your program as being superfluous and thereby try to alter the scope of the program in such a way as to reduce its impact below a point of viability. Far more important are those barriers that adhere directly to the individuals your program uh, attempts to serve. And these include literacy and health literacy, uh, both the population, uh, there's both a, 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 a pop, the, the, the populations you're trying to serve have a distrust of the medical establishment, but also the medical establishment often houses implicit biases toward the, the populations you're trying to help. Um, there are sometimes uh, these individuals have no transportation access or they have extremely restricted or limited uh, transportation resources. Um, they, it, is, uh, it has already been uh, studied and shown that individuals involved in drug courts often have uh, no access to primary care or have not availed themselves of primary care prior to uh, their uh, participation in a drug, uh, drug treatment court. And in most of these cases, the drug treatment court does not provide or require uh, primary care uh, access. So now, I, just to be clear, I do think these things constitute different kinds of barriers. I'm not really getting into that very much. Uh, that is that they may be barriers that affect an individual's interest in or motivation to join your program. They may be barriers that drive down the ability of a person to access or use your program, or they may be barriers that have an impact on success rates. In any case, these are all things that you can try to design solutions for uh, directly into your program, so long as you are aware of what those barriers are. Uh, and I just sort of want to draw your attention to like how many of these things are related to uh, the administrative or day-to-day -day burden of their involvement in a, in a DTC. For example, if the, if the judge requires uh, somebody to be looking for work, uh, and also requires that they receive counseling and also requires that they show up for repeated hearings, which are sort of a standard here. Uh, those are all different um, places and times that a person uh, has to be. And if they lack transportation or have extremely uh, restricted transportation options, that becomes very hard. And so uh, failure to comply uh, becomes less a measurement of their motivation and their willingness and more a measurement of their um, sort of um, geographical or monetary financial resources. <laughs>
So with the barriers and constraints uh, discussion sort of out of the way, uh, although I do encourage a discussion around that topic if it interests you, I, I do want to proceed to uh, the more positive aspect of, of this work, which is what, what can we do? So what follows is by no means exhaustive, uh, by any means, not by any stretch of the imagination. It, it, it's, it's quite the opposite. This is consciously just a couple common starting points. In fact, uh, I'm gonna be focusing on uh, two key areas mentioned in module one. Uh, and that's a screening for tobacco use and then referral to treatment. I wanna focus on those two areas because they tend to be uh, more directly aligned with uh, public health uh, goals. Uh, these are areas that are also low burden uh, for non-health systems uh, that are general, generally aligned with the with processes that are already taking place. Uh, in our case, for example, uh, a screening process exists in all DTCs, and they're screening for both legal eligibility and they're also screening clinically. And so that's an opportunity for us to get tobacco involved, and that's what we want to talk about first. Uh, so I want to appeal to something uh, right now, before I go forward, to something that I said in the first module, that for public health to find new partners with whom to develop a health neighborhood, we have to speak their language. That, and that doesn't mean you have to adopt their values. It would be possible, for example, that if the second generation courts had never evolved, if we were still dealing with uh, drug courts that, uh, that focus specifically on the speed and efficiency of the trial pro or the hearing and trial process and not the treatment aspect. You would still have uh, at its heart an institution that believed in a very simple model that addiction causes criminality and that to reduce criminality you should treat addiction. But as it is, what you have is in reality is a court system that not only firmly believes that but is already engaged in treatment in a very real way and one that also believes success should be measured not in terms of re-arrest or at least not in terms of re-arrest alone, but also in terms of recovery, stable employment, housing, and other person-centered achievements. All you have to do is make the case that tobacco cessation can help in all of those other things, but most importantly, as an evidence-based augmentation to substance use recovery efforts. So just to reiterate, uh, this focus, or the focus of this community of practice is on getting tobacco cessation services integrated into the various criminal justice interception points. And this presentation is focusing specifically on the drug courts. I'm gonna bounce around a little bit from tobacco cessation services in specific and social needs provision and connection more generally. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the case study I'm gonna present focuses specifically on connecting people to non-medical social resources. And even though that case study doesn't mention tobacco cessation specifically, the general lesson of that case study still applies to tobacco cessation. And I'm gonna use it here in the context of how it matters to tobacco cessation. Specifically, I wanna set up, I'm gonna talk about tobacco screening and tobacco referral, and then I want you to think about that screening and referral process uh, in terms of the, what the case study is talking about, which is the social needs connection. Which is all to say that getting tobacco cessation services into these environments, that that is the drug courts or the criminal justice uh, domain more largely, is every bit as easy or as difficult as inserting anything into the, into the justice system. And strategies that work in one of these areas will generally work in both. It just so happens that there's been a lot more interest in getting, for example, housing resource connections into jails then getting tobacco cessation resources into DTCs. The thing to keep in mind is that whether your goal is substance use related or upstream social needs related or directly related to tobacco cessation exclusively, we want to think about tobacco cessation services in terms of the five A's as this is a good way of strategically aligning what we know works for tobacco cessation with what is already happening in other domains. So before I begin detailing this slide, I should mention that there are typically two components in a DTC. I've already brought this up a couple times, um, but they're, they're, it's normally tied together as just screening because they happen at the same time or are often delivered by the same people, by the same individual. Uh, but we really are talking about a legal screening on the one hand, which determines whether or not you know, is this person a, a violent offender, is this person uh, disqualified for other reasons related to prior offenses, that sort of thing. And then there's the clinical screening. Um, 
But what we, what I want to point out, and what, what the slide is sort of about in some of the ways, and, and this shows up in the um, case study as well, is that even when, uh, when a clinical screening is applied, it's some, they're often not using a validated instrument, and also even when they're using a validated instrument, they're not necessarily using it the right way or the way that we would recommend. So, in terms of a tool to determine an individual's clinical needs, there are a few common choices. One of the most common, at least in the substance abuse specific world, say residential substance abuse or something similar, is the Addiction Severe Severity Index. The National Association of Drug Court Professionals, as far as I know, has not yet endorsed that particular tool, but the National Drug Court Institute does. It's a long instrument. So if I, if I had to figure out, if I had to speculate as to why uh, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals hasn't endorsed the tool, it's because it's, it's really long. But uh, what's important about its length is that it covers, uh, it serves a lot of purposes. Also in the running for the most common among the endorsed tools is what's called the TCU Drug Screen 2. TCU stands for Texas Christian University. TCU Drug Screen 2. What these two tools I've mentioned have in common, in addition to being free to use, is that neither of them asks about tobacco, cigarettes, or nicotine in any form. And I, I'd like to say I'm surprised by that, but of course I'm not. This is a pretty common feature of our general public health approach to nicotine use. To provide uh, just briefly another example of that though, uh, Dr. Morris in the last presentation mentioned a, a recent Surgeon General's report on our current uh, national drug use. That report also does not mention nicotine except to literally say that nicotine is covered elsewhere, <laughs> um, which is true uh, and I suppose fine, but it also means that there's a small barrier between substance abuse professionals and the tobacco knowledge that they should have to properly treat the, the specific addictions that they already prioritize. But of course, that's a, a bit of a digression. The point here is that you should at the very least know whether the current screening instrument, whatever it is, asks tobacco questions. And if not, which is likely, getting the DTC to add them can be a pretty low effort win all by itself. And by low effort, I mean, ultimately, the work that has to be done to get it in there is pretty low. It really is just adding that sentence to the form. Uh, but I'm not saying that the meetings and phone calls and discussions and education that you may have to provide is low effort, by the way. I just want to make that clear. And also, I want to point out that low effort is not the same as no effort at all. We should keep in mind that the eligibility screening process can be pretty long all by itself. Um, uh, both of these two eligibility screenings, the, the combined screening can be pretty long. Uh, and so court professionals and also the participants who are uh, seeking eligibility are pretty sensitive to additional paperwork. So your screening questions, whatever they are, should be pretty short. I recommend the two from the heaviness of smoking index or the six questions from the Fager Strong Test for Nicotine Dependence. And I'll put both of those on the COP resource site. It's worth pointing out that many DTCs do not use the clinical component of the intake screening process in the same way that a substance use uh, clinician might, substance use disorder clinician might. As such, they may not be using a clinically validated instrument at all. In fact, in a recent survey, only 58% of drug courts were using one of the six validated instruments recommended by the NADCP. And when they, even when they are using them, they may not be using it in a clinically validated way. And as an example of that, some courts don't limit participation in a drug court to individuals with severe dependence. They allow in uh, lower levels of dependence. And this can be problematic because not only do DTC programs work best for those with higher dependence, DTC programs can actually cause drug use to go up in individuals with lower or no dependence. And the causal pathway here seems to be that by broadening the individual's social networks to include more high propensity users, they themselves develop into high propensity users. Now, we're not here to fix every problem in every drug court. We're just concentrating on what we can or what we can improve as it relates to nicotine dependence. So in some instances, depending on the motivation and commitment of the courts uh, to play along with you, this uh, adjusting a referral process uh, may be just as low burden uh, as adding a couple questions to screening is. The chances are that the courts are already engaged in some sort of referral process. The questions we have are, how effective are these referrals? And where, where can we insert tobacco into the process? So we have to know to whom the courts are referring and what triggers the referral. 
In our case, what we're looking for is a, that a positive screen for tobacco use should trigger a referral to the uh, Arizona Smokers Helpline at least. If a referral to the ASH line is already happening, at least in theory, then we want to try and help tighten up that process and get more referrals to enroll, more enrollees to complete, and more completers to quit. Better yet, we'd like to get tobacco treatment into, their behavior, into the, the, the participant's behavioral health treatment plan. And for that to happen, you, instead of working with the courts, you may end up working directly with the clinicians that the courts use to provide the drug counseling, all of whom, all drug counselors, are professionally qualified to work on nicotine, even if they need some modest education and training to help them transfer those skills. A sort of middle case scenario is working with community behavioral health organizations on their ashline processes. So before moving into our, our highest effort strategy, I wanna to pause to look at a case study that I tagged with the word connect in the upper right there. This is a story of, successful, uh, of a successful structure for matching patients with non-medical needs that I ran across, interestingly enough, in a publication called Quality Improvement for Drug Courts, Evidence-Based Practices. I tagged it with the word connect because the intervention is about connecting patients with the things they need, but it's also about connecting the referral process back to the intake process. And it's about connecting the intake to referral process to the administrators in a meaningful way. The substance abuse facilities in this study already used the ASI, the Addiction Severity Index that I mentioned. The ASI screens for the severity of addiction, uh, as its name implies, but it also screens for other features that may be connected to the individual's use of intoxicating substances, including their legal issues, their housing situation, medical, employment, family, and social and psychological needs basically things that appear in that risk factors box on that slightly more uh, complicated, simple model of how drug courts work. And just a quick aside to remind you that ASI does not screen for tobacco use of any kind. Okay, a previous survey of entities that use the ASI had found that those responsible for filling it out, that is the, the uh, case managers or the intake specialists, the administrators that filled, actually asked the questions and filled out the form, found it to be nothing more than paperwork. It was just busy work to them. And in a way, those survey respondents weren't wrong because they were being mandated, typically by a state organization or some other governmental or organizational body, to use it. They were being told they had to use it, but they had no mandate, charter, funds, or resources to do anything about what they were finding out. And I just want to emphasize, this tool is 13 pages of questions and instructions. It takes a while to fill it out. So the hypothesis of this case study was that if they connected the information that was gathered on the ASI um, to resources that case managers could provide, then the treatment service would be, quote unquote, better matched. Now, in order to do that, these researchers had to build a specific database that had in it the resources, the, re the referral sites, that might address each of the gaps the ASI is designed to reveal. They had to build that database because this paper was written in 2002 when the internet was but a wee baby. An update recommended by the author of this study is to simply use online services like the United Way's 211 program, which is what the case managers that I worked with in Tucson were still were already using back in 2012. So the question is, were the clients better matched? They were, which is good and something we should keep in mind, but there were other outcomes as well. Not only were the referral re recommendations just better, the uptake of those recommended services was higher. You could see how one of those would follow from the other. And clients were less likely to leave the treatment program early, which is also interesting and potentially valuable. Um, but an interesting side effect was, uh, and, and this makes perfect sense to me, uh, is that the case managers who were instructed how to make these connections and, given, and those that were given the tools to do so stayed in their jobs longer. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions whether that was a statistical anomaly or, or whether it was directly related to the intervention itself. So now, and again, very briefly, I just wanna go into our highest intensity intervention. Briefly, not because it's the least important, but because its realization is just a little bit more out of reach. And that is if your court has hired social worker, workers that act as counselors 
in and for the drug courts, you can get them trained and educated to provide cessation counseling along with whatever other issues uh, that that client is working on. Or you can get them trained to run psychoed groups, the therapeutic groups, that kind of thing. Now, most court systems are small enough and their dockets are full enough that it doesn't make good sense for them to offer these services themselves on site. If you have a court system that does use on-site drug counselors uh, or who provide groups on site, then this is pretty great. As we already mentioned, one of the biggest barriers to success in a DTC program is the day-to-day -day burden that the participant suffers. Making every meeting, getting to every counseling session, attending every year analysis, calling the various uh, numbers and entering the various codes needed to see if your number was randomly selected, filling out a reform, uh, filling out applications if seeking work has been added to your program goals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. Basically, if drug counseling and court appearances are happening in the same place at roughly the same times, that's best for the participant. But in the rare instances where that is actually happening, you would still want to assess the status of tobacco in that process. Is it the case that even if you were to get a counselor to agree to add tobacco cessation to participants' treatment plans, where is screening happening and who's doing it? How is drug dependency being assessed? Can nicotine be added to that process? How can nicotine be addressed in session? Does the court already use peers? And if not, can they? If they're willing at least to provide materials, what demographic characteristics are common enough that tailored materials make therapeutic and the logistical sense to provide them? From this perspective, Mojave County's model, Mojave County's model, which was presented at the last learning community call, is somewhere in between training court staff and a solid referral system in terms of its intensity. In their case, they provide tobacco education and an introduction to cessation along with a way to integrate that into their drug court program, as well as a warm connection to other public health services they may want to avail themselves of. So finally, I wanna uh, point out uh, that one of the reasons that courts are potentially important uh, community-based partners is because they sit at the hub at the intersection of several other entities that are also hubs themselves. Working with the courts means potentially being able to expand into court adjacent entities like jails and prisons. Courts may send participants to a local community behavioral health organization that can then make warm, tailored referrals to local housing authorities who can then connect the participants to things like food or heating assistance. And those housing authorities may be able to, uh, I'm sorry, those uh, community behavioral health organizations may be able to offer in-school assistance for children with acute behavioral issues. Uh, the community behavioral health organization may then refer somebody to a, 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 an enrollee to a local public library, which might have a peer navigator system in place that can make warm handoffs to local churches offering support and to employers willing to hire people who, quote unquote, have to check the box and on and on and on. So that is actually going to do it for me. Uh, before moving on, uh, just before closing up entirely and, and moving on, uh, I did leave a lot of room for questions. We're right about the 15 minute till mark. I wanted to uh, unmute uh, Chad and see if he had anything he wanted to uh, add or say before we move into Q&A. Great, thanks, thanks Jim. That was an, uh, just an excellent uh, overview of, of uh, drug courts and and some of the opportunities that they, they offer for really addressing uh, nicotine addiction. And uh, some of the points that you made that really stood out for me is whether it's uh, any kind of specialty court. I, I like the idea in these second generations how they're moving into more of a, a recovery orientation or a trauma-informed orientation or being more individualized, which really matches what we've, we've been uh, discussing. And just the fact that these are such great partners because they have, uh, drug courts have really a lot of, uh, or potentially a, a great deal of influence in, in uh, su suggesting and or mandating uh, different kinds of uh, connections with, uh, with the health neighborhood. Um, both, you know, again, as you mentioned, the, the, the full range of public services, uh, including treatment, and under that, including co-treatment, which uh, in our previous presentations, we've, we've talked about how effective those, those models are. Um, 
although you know tobacco drug courts have, have been proven effective uh, we don't have that that evidence base uh, in regard to incorporating uh, tobacco interventions in the drug courts, but it would make sense for all the reasons that Jim mentioned uh, that uh, uh, that effectiveness would increase e even more if we were addressing uh, tobacco or nicotine addiction in, a, in addition to other addictions. And the counties are just really poised to, to play a, a, a great role as as boundary spanners in that regard, uh, in that they might need to get up to speed on some of the language around drug courts or around the criminal justice uh, system, such as you know, ideas such as criminogenic risk factors and really speak that language. But um, you know, the counties in the, the really can play that role in knowing the language of the community and have that expertise in um, community systems and how you can uh, interconnect with both um, health systems as well as uh, other kind of treatment hubs. So, you know, I, I love the fact that uh, several of the counties are already working in, in, in this area. I just think this is a really rich opportunity. So thanks again, Jim, for the, uh, the uh, overview and love to uh, hear any kind of uh, comments or just perspectives or, or questions that uh, any of the uh, attendees have. Well, we're not seeing any yet or I'm missing them. If so if somebody wants to raise their hand and ask questions, we all means, uh, by all means hit that button. Uh, but I'm gonna on the springboard off something that, that Chad said that or that, that something uh, that Chad reminded me of, which is I had mentioned in the uh, during the presentation that um, the author of the case study recommends that you can just use United Ways 211, and that and that is true. That is largely true. And as a matter of fact, a, a lot of people who end up in um, court ordered services at community behavioral health organizations they're actually not assigned. It depends on the court system, obviously, and the judge, but they're often not assigned a counselor specifically. They're um, assigned a, either a, a, an organization that they have to enroll in or a case manager at that organization. And those case managers uh, often have and, and rely on 211, or they, like I said, they, they did when I was working at uh, La, uh, La Frontera in Tucson. Um, and one thing to note about that is that real, it's a really great resource, uh, but Tobacco cessation is largely not explicitly mentioned. So you can look up uh, drug, various drug recovery groups, or therapeutic groups, psychoeducational groups. Um, you'll find a list of all the various like Alcoholics Anonymous meetings in there, um, or Narcotics Anonymous, or all those sorts of groups. Uh, but a lot of those professionals who uh, you know run or oversee or manage those groups, uh, they're they're trained as as drug counselors uh, of various kinds, addictions counselors. They are able to treat nicotine, but they they uh, do not typically list it uh, separately. So that's a that's a great place where public health can sort of step in as um, a knowledge resource, a knowledge based resource that, that that is outside of what's currently technologically available to folks. So it would it would be great, like if you were to. I mean, if you're thinking about something like this, if you're thinking about a more intense intervention, you have time <laughs> and capacity to do it, is to introduce yourself to those case managers so that they know that they can separately contact you if somebody's interested in tobacco cessation, who's already involved in, they're already looking for a bed for them or a, a food resource or heating assistance or something. Yeah, Jim, you want to? Okay. Well, seeing no questions, uh, I guess I will go ahead and, and sign us off and stop the recording. Just to reiterate, we do have, oh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and mention this for those of you who are on the line. You're going to be seeing, receiving an email from me shortly. Um, Susan from Mojave uh, uh, pointed out to me that the CDC uh, has changed their meeting time uh, as they are updating people on the um, pulmonary uh, consequences of, of vaping right now. Uh, following that, that crisis and keeping people updated, that has moved. Uh, to Thursdays at 1. Some of you are probably already aware of that. Some of you are missing that call right now and probably uh, very bitter about it, and I apologize. Uh, but in response to that um, need, and th thanks again to Susan for pointing it out, we are moving the next learning community call uh, to an hour later. So you can attend the CDC call and then also attend our learning community call.
the CDC, as far as I know, has only released October's schedule. And so we'll revisit whether or not we want to keep the later hour as we move into uh, November and December and finish off the community of practice. But I will uh, update the appointment in Zoom, which will trigger you guys to get um, notified of the change. And I'll point it out in email, but that is why the change is happening. Uh, with that in mind, when you do see that um, invitation coming out from Outlook to join us for that meeting, please go ahead and accept that invitation and try to join us for that learning community call. I'm sure there'll be lots of good conversation. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on, we got a question coming in. Oh, <laughs> yes, no problem, Samantha. Lee, Ellie has said uh, thank you for moving the meeting. Not a problem at all. We want to make sure that you guys are getting the, the, the resources you need from the people who are best able to present them. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close us down. If you do think of questions, go ahead and uh, email them to either Chad or myself. Thanks everyone.